Association of the Philippines, alongside Mr. Arnel Almaden, Associate Director, Ms. Princesita, help me. Attorney Princesita Yulde from the Securities and Exchange Commission, Your Honor. Were you here in the last hearing? I uh, know, Your Honor. So this is your first time, uh, and uh, do we have anybody from the NEDA? Mr. Roberto Santos, you represent? Um, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm representing also Chamber of Three Banks with uh, Ms. Uh, Felix. Okay. Is there anybody from the PCCI? No. The Management Association of the Philippines? Voila. The European Chamber of Commerce? Ms. Good morning, Mr. Gia. Good morning, sir. Good morning. All right. Um, you know, there are just only a couple of issues remaining, and uh, we did request um, the Banco Central, uh, particularly um, Dr. Noe Travalo, to clarify those issues for us. Dr. Travalo, do you have? Uh, a report to the committee. Um, Mr. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the Dr. Uh, Ravalo, did you send us these documents this morning? Yes, Mr. Chairman. But you know, we can't absorb documents this sick. I uh, apologize, Mr. Chairman. We were working up to late last night to gather all the documents. Uh, it came from various sources. Uh, to the to the extent that uh, we would want we wanted to provide the uh, committee with a set of formal documents. I can uh, basically, if, if the chair would uh, permit, Mr. Chair, I, I, I can uh, basically summarize, uh, highlight the key points based on the matrix that the committee actually provided to us in terms of what was our deliverables. All right. Um, I see this covers the other two bills which uh, we are not uh, conducting a hearing on this morning. Uh, we are limiting ourselves uh, to Senate Bill 2159, which is a 7721. Well, I can't read it now because it's too thick, so. Why don't you explain it and read it into the record? Mr. Chairman, uh, going by the sequence of the items that were provided by the Secretariat for us, the first item had to do with the ASEAN Banking Integration Framework, and the request was for a summary of the principles. What we essentially provided is the ASEAN Economic Community uh, Declaration and the bottom line there, Mr. Chairman, is that the integration is about uh, becoming a regional hub so that they will, uh, the, the region as a whole will attract foreign investments. And in the, in the particular case of the ASEAN Banking Integration Framework, the context of banking integration was seen to be as the vehicle to bring in the foreign investments into the various ASEAN communities. So, uh, although the document is rather lengthy and wordy, the bottom line is really uh, to, to provide for foreign investments in the various uh, ASEAN communities. Go ahead. On the second item, Mr. Chair, on the matrix on limitations of foreign entry in ASEAN countries, uh, we find that uh, all ASEAN countries currently allow entry where the distinction would lie would be in the, uh, in the split between the local and the foreign equity. Uh, the, the, the low side would be that of Vietnam, which, has a, uh, which allows for a, a greater participation of foreign uh, uh, entities. So all of the ASEAN, uh, the 10 ASEAN jurisdictions would allow, except that in the Philippine context, the only allowable window right now is a joint venture via 60-40 split. And in most other jurisdictions, they would actually allow for a 100% ownership by a foreign entity. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, uh, in general, Banking Act, it limits foreign ownership to 40%, but 
I remember a few years ago, either we passed or there was an attempt to make it 100 percent. Can yeah. you update us? Uh, part of the execution, Mr. Chair, of 7721, there was a window, a seven-year window, which allowed for a entry of 100 percent ownership. That window is already closed, Mr. Chair. Now, the only uh, remaining window... But there are foreign banks here that are 100 percent owned. Yes, Mr. Chair. Which ones would that be? Uh, this would be the, uh, the the roster would include the um, the, the ten foreign banks. The, uh, I'm trying to recall off the top of my head, Mr. Chair. That's all right. Anyway, you can submit the list. But Citibank, that's 100 percent. Bank of America, that's 100 percent. Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, that's 100 percent. Standard Chartered Bank, that's 100 percent. Uh, what about Mizuho? Mizuho is included in the list, Mr. Chair. Uh, just for the record, uh, Citibank, Bank of America were actually present already in the Philippines at the time 7721 was passed. Uh, Not only that, so was HSBC and Stanchart. So yeah. the four of them were uh, included, Mr. Chair. The ten entrants uh, under that window would have been uh, Deutsche Bank, ANZ, uh, ING, Misuho, Bangkok Bank, Bank of China Limited, uh, Korean Exchange Bank, Mega International Commercial Bank, and Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi. All right. These all came in within the seven-year window. Yes, Mr. Chair. And so they're all 100%. Yes, Mr. Chair. Question. Maybank. Maybank 100% owned? It is uh, a subsidiary, Mr. Chair. It was set up as a subsidiary rather than that of a branch. Is it 100% owned? It's 100% owned subsidiary. Yes, Mr. Chair. It's 100%. Right. Then inform the committee, educate the committee. What's the difference between a foreign branch and a 100% owned subsidiary? It's uh, a legal uh, construction, Mr. Chair. A branch is still considered part of the parent company, whereas a subsidiary is a separate juridical entity. It's a corporation by itself. Okay, so in, in, what in is the difference, really? Uh, in terms of operation, Mr. Chair, we treat a branch as if uh, it's just a, an office of the parent. Uh, but for purposes Meaning of what? Meaning so you treat It's one it in like the same as the parent, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, it's as if the parent was here. Whereas as against? As against a subsidiary, which is a separate corporation incorporated in the Philippines. I still don't understand. How do you treat it differently? They're both banks. They're both operating as banks. They're both licensed as banks in a particular category, uh, say commercial bank, how, how do you treat a subsidiary differently from a branch? Mr. Chair, the subsidiary would be essentially it has its own articles of incorporation. It has yeah, you're talking of the form, that, that but how does the Banco Central as regulator treat a subsidiary differently from the branch of a foreign bank. Oh, in, in terms of regulation, Mr. Chair, uh, the, the framework will be largely the same. It's still risk-based. In fact, for a branch, although technically it is part of the parent, we actually require them to have onshore capital as well. So the distinction is uh, rather minimal from a supervisory standpoint. Okay. C could you define risk-based for us, please? Uh, under the prior framework of banking supervision, it was a checklist methodology. So there were certain, certain things that you would look for when you would audit a bank or you, you would expect them certain behaviors in a certain well-defined form. A risk-based framework basically dispenses with a checklist and tries to make a determination whether the bank is o uh, operating within prudential limits. For example, you're, you can take more risks if you want, as long as you have more capital. So we don't have to prescribe that. 
we also do not have to prescribe things that are inherently of a business decision nature. So in recent years, Mr. Chair, we have uh, begun to take away the branching restrictions. Uh, there used to be a restriction on Metro Manila uh, cities and, and uh, uh, on the premise that it is already overcrowded. Now we've moved on to saying you want to set up a branch, you think you can compete, you're on your own, as long as you can cover the, uh, the risks that are involved. Um, so behave, in, in terms of governance, uh, the bottom line of risk base is that you would be permitted to do what you ask to do for as long as you show the capability to manage all the risks that are attendant to that activity. Um, I have other issues with that, but uh, with respect to the bill, you've limited foreign sub-branches to five. Yes. Now, suppose or that correspondent country that we're trying to, that we're dealing with, limits it to 10 or, or 20. Uh, what happens then? Uh, two things, Mr. Chair. Can, can, can they ask for 10 or 20 from us? Uh, Mr. Chair, since it would be in the letter of the law, and then uh, that would be essentially the binding constraint. Uh, on the on the point uh, raised by the chair in the previous hearing on why five, why not six, why not ten, the answer to that was in the in the current version of seven seven to one, six is actually allowed, and that six is counted as sort of the head plus another five sub branches. So we were just uh, aligning it to the old seven seven to one. Okay, let's not align uh, because we're amending seven seven to one. Suppose we put in a phrase that shall be limited to five some branches or any such number as may be later on approved by the monetary board. Would that be acceptable? So it gives you some flexibility and, and, and uh, you know you don't have to uh, come back to Congress and say, please amend this and make it 10 or make it 15. We would welcome that, Mr. Chair. So there's no objection to that, even from... Uh, what about from the Bankers Association, Cesar? Um, Your Honor, good morning. Good we morning. have no objections to that. All right. Thank you. How many more foreign banks do we expect? What we did, Mr. Chair, is uh, we went back to our uh, records. I will submit this as well to the committee. Uh, on Officially, we have inquiries from Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan, and Czech Republic. In addition to these four jurisdictions, Mr. Chair, we have a number of representative offices already operating in the Philippines and may actually consider uh, converting themselves into either a full-blown branch or a subsidiary. Uh, these are uh, Bank of Singapore, Barclays, Cathay United, DBS, Japan Bank of International Cooperation, Rothschild Singapore, State Bank of India, Sumitomo Mitsui, Bank of New York Mellon, Export Import Bank of Korea, UBS AG, as well as Wells Fargo Bank, Mr. Chair. So it, it would seem that uh, at least in terms of potential, there would be quite a bit of a potential. Um, and we are also informed that uh, we have recently received a, a number of uh, queries from law offices, but the uh, law offices would not want to divulge at this time their clients. All right. Now, let's go back to reciprocity because there's one item there that I'm not quite clear on if we get questioned on the floor. We allow five. Is that in keeping with our commitment to the ASEAN uh, Banking Integrated Framework commitment, uh, Treaty? The ABI framework, Mr. Chair, would simply state that the rules of the host country will prevail. So if the letter of the law says uh, pick a number 10, then it will be limited to 10. So in certain instances then, um, we can set limits? Yes, Mr. Chair. And if we are the host country, then those limits prevail? Yes, Mr. Chair. What other limits 
should we be looking at in order to comply with our commitments under the Asian, integra uh, Asian Banking Integrated Framework? The, the framework calls for an equal treatment between that of a foreign bank and a domestic bank. So uh, any rule, uh, any prudential guideline that you actually provide for a domestic bank, whether it's branching, uh, office hours, uh, length of banking hours rather, or or things like uh, rediscount window, all of those must be provided as well to the potential entrant foreign bank. All right. So therefore, under equal treatment, why then are we giving foreign banks a larger single borrower limit? Well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase that. It may not be larger, but it seems larger the way we read it. Uh, that is correct, Mr. Chair. It was uh, the way we had phrased it is uh, up to the full amount of the permanently assigned capital. And at the time, we had suggested that the permanently assigned capital was still the 210 um, million pesos. So it is fairly a small amount. Uh, but as I clarified in the previous hearing, the potential foreign bank entrant is still required to comply with all prudential guidelines, the Basel III ratios which effectively means they will have to raise capital anyways. Uh, but we, we submit to the uh, preference. What, what is the rule for local banks? It's 25. 25% it's of? Net worth. Of net worth. Yes, Mr. Chair. That includes retained earnings. Yes, Mr. Chair. All right. And so, you know, it, it's not really apples and oranges when you say 100% of... Uh, Assigned capital? Permanently assigned. Of, of permanently assigned capital and 25% of net worth. Why can't we use the same phrase, 25% of net worth? And, 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 and of, let the foreign banks be, be, be forced to increase uh, their net worth. They, they can always increase their capital anytime, anyway. Uh, we would have no objections, Mr. Chair. So would you rephrase that for us and, yes, and, and, and send it to us? Thank you. I hope the local banks are amenable to that. May we know if there are any objections. Don't please don't nod your head because it, uh, that that can't be recorded. So speak into the microphone. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, we uh, we uh, we support this uh, proposed amendment as you uh, stipulated. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I I would like to ask the Assistant Governor whether. There is a difference between assigned capital and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the foreign banks and uh, uh, net worth vis-a-vis uh, -vis the local banks. Would one or the other be disadvantaged if 25% uh, was based on either figure? Did you understand the question? Uh, yes, you, you will have to address your question to the chair, and the chair will repeat it to the resource persons, in this case, those representing the Banco Central. Now, did you understand the question? Yes, yes, Mr. Chair. Would you like to respond? Um, permanently assigned capital is a smaller number compared to net worth because for foreign banks, aside from permanently assigned, there will be the net due to, due from concept, which is uh, pretty much uh, tier two consideration, Mr. Chair. So if the uh, uh, preference of the committee right now is to align the two, then it would read essentially as 25% of uh, net worth for both domestic and for foreign bank. So there would be no uh, arbitrage whatsoever. Mr. Vertusha, did you get that? I, I got that, uh, Your Honor. Is and that, that clear enough to you? Are you, are you? It is clear enough. Okay. I, I would, I would thank, thank you. Thank you. Now, would you like to tell the committee if other forms of banks would be allowed under the uh, ASEAN Banking Integrated Framework? I'm talking about investment banks, financial company, fi finance companies, thrift banks, shadow banks. You know, the shadow banks, they're not really banks, so they don't fall under the regulatory ambit of the, the Banco Central de Filipinas, but uh, recent articles in various financial journals have been uh, 
warning about uh, the huge amount of money uh, being coursed as like normal bank lending to the private sector. What about those types of banks? Would they be covered by the framework? Right now, Mr. Chair, what would be covered are the traditional banks, regardless of whether it will be a universal commercial thrift or rural, uh, as far as we are concerned in the Philippine context. Uh, there is currently no jurisprudence whatsoever or even regulatory framework for shadow banks. These are considered to be a uh, vulnerability and the, there are uh, interagency work currently ongoing to try to address that vulnerability. All right. Would you have anything today or tomorrow that could somehow address shadow banks so that you don't come back to us next year and say, can we please have an additional amendment? Uh, is, is there something we can put into the law, uh, right into the law, uh, that says uh, the Banco Central shall have uh, regulatory control over? And I don't think we can use the phrase shadow banks. There, there must be something that would more appropriately and describe it in technical banking terms. We believe, Mr. Chair, that... Uh, uh fundamental work of shadow banking or any other type of uh, uh, side activity would be the management of credit. So in the proposed charter amendment, the wording that we had used was really to expand what was already embedded in the Constitution, the oversight of money, credit, and banking. We simply had a little bit more of a language to that. For example, we did not imagine five years ago that there will be such a thing called e-banking. Uh, these are fairly new ideas. Uh, we did not imagine a year ago the idea of bitcoins, which are unregulated but uh, growing in some jurisdiction and stopped totally in other jurisdictions. <coughs> so instead of having to outline each and every potential uh, undertaking, the proposal that the Banco Central put forward, Mr. Chair, is uh, through the Charter Amendment, if, if the uh, committee may so uh, consider. Yeah, but uh, I told Governor Bicacino it might take us 10 years to pass the Charter uh, Amendment, so uh, don't you want to put anything in this law? Uh, we, we can propose, Mr. Chair. Propose something and... Uh, Let's check it out with the members of the Senate. Now, the 70% limit on total assets, again in the last hearing, in the last hearing I asked, why not 60%? Why not 50%? Somebody must have pulled something out of the air, that number out of the air when we say 70% of total assets must be controlled by Filipinos. Mr. Chair, we, we actually went back to the uh, Senate deliberations, and this was in the uh, discussion with then Senator Rocco. My understanding of what I, the, the copy I received with respect to the deliberations was that uh, this was precisely asked by then Senator Tanyada. The answer was of Senator Rocco was that uh, uh, based on the data that he had carried, there was no jurisdiction that would cross 20%. The initial number, apparently, that the chamber had thought about was 40. So the 30 was sort of the compromise number. That's the reading I had, Mr. Chair, of the Senate deliberations. So you say that's a political compromise. There are no numbers to back it up. Yes, Mr. Chair, and what we actually did was we tried to generate our own numbers, and uh, I, I did not uh, venture to include it in your folio because the numbers do not look, look to be very credible at this time. It would be jumping anywhere from uh, a low of about 10%, and supposedly some jurisdictions have over 100%, which, which theoretically cannot be. So we... If you can give us uh, a day or two to just revalidate the numbers, we'll submit, Mr. Chair. All right. Um, we don't have any particular position on that issue, 
it all depends upon the collective uh, uh, opinion of the uh, current stakeholders in the banking system. So, Mr. Vertuccio, would you have any idea what would be a safe number where we don't restrict too much but we don't also expose too much? Your Honor, it might be useful if we we had a, say for example, a figure of what it is currently. In other words, what is the current uh, uh, The current is 11 percent. If I'm correct, 11 percent would be uh, the foreign, foreign, uh, and so they will have uh, under this proposal, uh, they could go up to 30 percent. That's that right. Uh, that seems to be uh, good enough. See, uh, that's what I'm worried about because everybody's guessing, everybody's saying that seems to be, and uh, I'd like this to be based on numbers. Like I could go into detail. I would say what are the assets that the bank carries on its books. It's not only loans receivables that any layman would, would be talking about. You've got trading accounts, you've got all sorts of uh, uh, other uh, banking activities. Now, uh, if, if, but to the layman, to the layman, they say to nila, wow, they have 70% of deposits. That not, that's not true, 70% of assets is not 70% of deposits. I, I I think, if I remember correctly, what, our total deposit base is roughly, what, 50, 60, 65% of total assets today among all types of banks? It's larger, Mr. Chair. What is it? Uh, my recollection is it's close to 70, thereabouts. All right. So, uh, 70%. So, it's 70 of 70, so... If, if the Philippine uh, banks have 70% of assets, they really have 70, 70 about 49% of deposits. Am I correct? They could have as little as 49% of, of deposits. Yes, Mr. Chair. The, the, the of course, it's not proper to, <laughs> to apply that general formula to every... Bank, but go ahead. Right now, Mr. Chair, the as of March 31, 2014, the total assets of the Philippine banking system is just a little over 10 trillion pesos. That includes domestic and foreign. The share of the foreign is uh, one, a little over one trillion, Mr. Chair. One trillion seventy-one billion, actually, is the official number. Yes, that's 11%. Uh, there are about 10.61. Right. Tell me, how many percent of total deposits do the foreign banks have? 8.63, uh, Mr. Chair. So, uh, therefore, it's, it's much less than uh, uh, the total asset. It's not even a one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chair. All right. Well, we'll uh, leave it at... at at 70 percent, but I, I wanted to give also the central bank flexibility there. Shall we say 70 percent or any such amount that the monetary board may deem proper? Again, it's an escape clause, but it also does not limit you guys too much, uh, because I know you... <laughs> I have so many amendments to <laughs> We just passed the Rural Bank Charter, we've got this today, then we have the um, PDIC Charter, then the, the, the Banco Central Charter. We, we don't want to have you guys ha coming back every 10 or 20 years saying, kailangan palitan ito, we have to be more competitive. And uh, we, we understand that, so um, we would rather give more leeway to the regulator themselves itself, uh, which is the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, uh, as determined by the Monetary Board. So, if there are no objections among the stakeholders presently here today, Mr. Bertuccio? Uh, Your Honor, I would, we, we would have no objections to that for as long as the flexibility is to increase or decrease the percentage of... Yes, 
yes, they will be able to increase or decrease. Um, so we will remove the cap of 70%. We will just use that as a guideline, but by the going 80% or by the going 60%. All right? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, now, what about the thrift banks and, and, and the rural banks? Would this amendment, do you envision this amendment automatically amending the rural bank charter, for example, which we just amended a year ago, over a year and a half ago, and open them up to 100%. In other words, if we want to be competitive, we'd like to include the rural areas in this also. Uh, and uh, we're, we're, we seek the guidance of the Banco Central uh, as to whether this should also be extended to the rural banking and the thrift bank sector or subsectors. Under the ABI framework, Mr. Chair, it is not limited to uh, commercial banks only, and certainly the thrift. So it's and all banks. Yes, Mr. Chair, as long as it is a bank. All right. Savings and loans are not banks. Uh, no, sir. Uh, Mr. Bertuccio, do you agree or disagree? Your Honor, yes, we do. Okay. Thrift banks, Ms. Felix. We we agree, Your Honor. Ms. Gia, you're quiet. Do you have any? In uh, do you want to share with us? Your Honor, um, actually, uh, we just received a notice. Can you uh, speak, for the, speak into the mic, please? I'm sorry. Uh, we just received a notice for the position paper yesterday. And actually... Well, that was our trick, you know, so that you don't have any... <laughs> and actually, no, I'm just kidding you. Um, um, I just joined ECCP about less than a month ago, and um, I was asked by Mr. Schumacher to um, just reserve our right to submit the position paper um, it shall be forthcoming, Your Honor. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, can, yes, we, can we get it, say, within five uh, days? Yes, Your Honor. By next Wednesday, I'm talking about five working days. Yes, Your Honor. Because we would like to finalize the committee report and bring this to the floor. I have it signed first, of course. Yes, sir. Your Honor. We will comply. Okay. Thank you. From the... Miss... Wild, is it? I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. I I'm from the SEC, Your Honor. Yeah. Um, we also reserve the right to submit our position paper. Uh, we'll submit it next week, Your Honor. We're finalizing it. I can't read your name because of the glare that's in the light. How do you spell that? Yolde? Yolde. Yolde. Spell that for me, please. Y U L D E. Oh, yes, I have your name here, but it's under Department of Finance. SEC ka pala. Yes, Your Honor. And from Mr. Mariano. Is Mr. Mariano around now? Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Uh, we also just received the no, uh, the memo to uh, for a position paper from the DOF. Um, and as, uh, the B, uh, on the part of the BTR, the BTR acknowledge and commends the BSP in its mandate of regulating the banking industry as evidenced by its current healthy state as well as with the prudent uh, statutes which are uh, currently ahead as compared to our international other international standards such as Basel III. Uh, from the part of the BTR, uh, we note that uh, there's the applicability of current banking laws on all participants in the industry as stated in the bill. Uh, we would just like to respectfully enjoin the BSP to continue its vigilance in monitoring and the regulation of the industry, especially as we prepare for closer integration with the region, as this uh, could, uh, so that we can possibly control episodes of contagion coming from external sources, and also to make sure that, uh, of course, all of our current banking laws will be uh, prepared for the entry of these foreign banks, so as to maintain macro stability. That's all, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Is there anybody else whom the chair has not called for their comments. All right. My last question uh, of you, uh, Noel.
Wet and uh, Governor Vick has to do with the rural sector. Of course, we know we are aware the BSP has been trying to get those banks merged. We've got 600 banks lying out there, and uh, that doesn't make sense anymore. I'm trying to frame the question, how much faster will the, the consolidation of the smaller banks be enhanced by the passage of this bill into law? Mr. Chair, uh, the, the sentiment of the supervision and examination sector is that right now, uh, even without the external competition, there is internal competition already happening for the rural banks. In, many areas what you find is a rural bank competing with a co-op and a co-op has a lower cost of doing business so in terms of trying to be to stay viable uh, they have a, a competition there we're also seeing that um, um, uh, a few of the established banks are moving out of the first class cities municipalities and venturing into second and third class municipalities so that is a competition from the top. And the, uh, the, the view that we have shared with the rural banking industry is that they need to seriously think about right-sizing themselves. Either that means getting bigger so that you can get a wider scope, or that means trying to, uh, trying to streamline because there is also that option to just to be financially inclusive by doing alternative delivery mechanisms. Uh, so the, the choice right now is really left to them from a business standpoint. The entry of a foreign bank uh, potentially into the Philippines, into ASEAN in particular, in many ways will simply hasten the competition. The reason for that, Mr. Chair, is the attraction of ASEAN is that of a retail market. It's not the corporate market that is uh, really the prime uh, attraction right now. You have a region that is uh, over 600 million in inhabitants whose uh, saving rate is over 30% when the world is only saving about 19%. So that differential of 11% gross domestic saving currently is invested abroad, U.S. Treasuries. What is our savings rate here? In the Philippines right now, we're about 24, 25, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, we're still lower than that of the, the four biggest ASEAN economies, which are doing about 34%. Uh, but the, the tendency for ASEAN is to invest abroad. So if, if ASEAN can get together as a block, as a trade and regional block, and keep it saving within the region, that's going to be a huge financial boost. But that boost will also go to a region whose demographics tend to be very young. Uh, in the region, we are the currently the youngest economy by age. So our average age is about 23 years old. Uh, the average age in ASEAN is about 31, 32 years old. So from a consumer finance standpoint, that's a huge potential for the next three, four decades, Mr. Chair. Very good. Now, we can wind up this hearing subject to certain information that the chair has asked uh, uh, SEC and uh, ECOP, e ECCP. Um, I'll give you a last opportunity to comment so that it will be spread on the record. Does anybody want to add anything to what we've discussed already? Yes, Ms. Gia. Thank you, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I would just like to read into the bring the, bring the mic closer to I'm you, sorry. please. I would just like to um, read into the record the position of ECCP, European Chamber of Commerce, which is in general, uh, which is a general position, because uh, we will be s submitting our position paper by Wednesday. Um, ECCP actually. So you will have two position papers. Um, this is actually a general sentiment of the ECCP, but um, we would get into an in-depth uh, detail comments on the in the position paper that we will be submitting, Your All Honor. Right. Um, uh, 
May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes, um, please. Thank you. Um, the ECCP actually is fully supportive of the amendment of the Senate Bill 2159 because uh, to its mind it can pave the way for more competition and capital that ultimately benefits the public and uh, the amendment is also consistent with the policy direction of the BSP to introduce reforms to make the banking industry more responsive to the needs of the stakeholders in the market conditions and uh, we are of the belief that uh, uh, it can prepare the Philippines to the ASEAN financial integration so, Your Honor, um, we will address uh, more in-depth details in our position paper. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Who's, yes, uh, Cesar. Uh, Your Honor, we, it's, it's basically uh, simply a statement. The Bankers Association of the Philippines represent uh, commercial banks, both local and foreign, and that includes uh, European banks. So if uh, ECCP would like to coordinate with us, uh, we would welcome it. Thank you. All right. Um, question lang. Sometimes it's confusing because you'll read or we will read about the integration of the ASEAN economic uh, community by 2015, whatever that means. And then the banking by 2020. What's the difference? <laughs> I mean, what do they expect from uh, the banking sector by 2015 vis-à-vis -vis 2020? Yes, please. Uh, the original ASEAN draft, uh, when it was drafted in 1997, Mr. Chair, was a 2020 vision. So the original deadline was everything was really 2020. Uh, a few years back, the political leaders got together and decided to accelerate it to 2015. So the ASEAN economic community of 2015 includes the uh, movement of goods, services, individuals, uh, free flow of trade, balance of payments, and so forth and so on. Initially, the banking deadline was also 2015. However, it was the uh, view of the committee working on the integration that 2015 at that time would not be a viable target. So we went back to 2020. So as far as the ASEAN Bank... Why? What would happen? Allow, allow me to interrupt you. Why? What's, what still needs to be done that you feel it will take until 2020? Uh, for one, Mr. Chair, the, the official document on qualified ASEAN banks has really not been signed yet. Uh, and that's in the very final stages. Uh, issues about reciprocity, issues about what is, uh, there are certain terminologies. Uh, who can qualify as an ASEAN bank? Will a foreign bank qualify as an ASEAN when bank? When is that expected? Uh, in the next quarter or so, Mr. Chair. All right, so that still brings us only to 2015. What else is required? What's, what's holding things up? In, in each of the countries, Mr. Chair, there will be certain regulations that will need to be revisited. For example, in, in our case, that will be the amendment to 7721. I understand Singapore has some uh, one or two uh, uh, laws that will have to be revisited as well because it is in their law that uh, uh, it, it is currently not equal treatment between domestic and foreign bank. There are also preparations with the market, Mr. Chair. You would want to give the industry a couple of years uh, in preparation why, because, number one, they will have to prepare their people. Competition outside is not something that we are, that is the norm right now for us. So, development of individuals, development of systems. If you're going to have a, a branch within ASEAN, how does that link to your back office here in Manila? Will that be real-time online and so forth and so on? So the view, and, and there were certain jurisdictions as well who felt that they currently have existing uh, bilateral agreements with, within ASEAN. So that too needed to be uh, reviewed under what they call the AFAS, ASEAN, AFAS? Uh, ASEAN uh, Agreement on Services. Uh, it's essentially the regional protocol for the movement of, of financial services. So 
the, the expectation was it needed some time. And the five smallest ASEAN countries, uh, jurisdictions, Brunei, uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, also felt that they needed to prepare. So part of the preparation is a capacity building program. And we, uh, the Philippines actually chairs that undertaking with BCLMV. So we are kind of teaching the rest of ASEAN what banking would be. And, and the program will take us roughly five, seven years. All right. But I think we all realize that inter economic integration won't work unless you've got financial integration because that's your financial intermediary that controls the movement of money. Otherwise, it's already the established banks that would have an advantage. Or it's only the established banks the ASEAN-wide established banks that would have an advantage, maybe like Maybank and uh, the, Jap the big Japanese banks, etc. No? Uh, well, but it, uh, you know, if it would really take that long, uh, then it will take that May long. May I also add, Mr. Chair, that for ASEAN 5, it's not 2020, it's 2018. Okay. As, as, a, as a sort of the role model countries in ASEAN, we're expected to have a qualified ASEAN bank in place by 2018 so that it will give sort of the signal for the rest of ASEAN that 2020 is viable. Oh, good. So, um, having said that, uh, are there any, any other comments, reactions? Yes, uh, Governor Bates. Yeah. Uh, morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, for in, in behalf of the BSP, we just uh, would like to thank the committee chair and the stakeholders present um, for uh, giving us the opportunity to express uh, clearly the BSP's uh, comments and position on the proposed amendments uh, to RA7721 and for uh, the stakeholders uh, for their support uh, uh, to the bill and the passage of this bill. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Governor Vic. Uh, there being no other matters to discuss, this hearing of the Committee on Banks on RA7721 amendments is hereby adjourned. Thank you very much all for coming.